Hi, I'm Sheila Kuo. Welcome to Get Used to It, our monthly uh, discussion of lesbian and gay issues. And today I'm really pleased to have as my two guests, Kate Clinton and Urvashi Vat. Now you'll hear a whole lot more about them, I hope, from themselves. But to tell you a little bit about them, uh, Kate, since 1981, uh, as Kate says, about the same time that Ronald Reagan began performing his political comedy nationwide, uh, Kate started performing her own personal brand of political comedy, little pieces of which you'll see later in the show. Um, first on the women's music circuit, uh, very <laughs> high school cafeterias, uh, wherever we could. And then, of course, as Unitarian she deserves, churches. Unitarian it's churches, always, everything started there, <laughs> right? Uh, and as she now deserves, of course, concert halls and national television. Uh, Irv Shivad, I'm sure there's just no one who hasn't seen Irv in something or other on, te <laughs> you know, her diatribing on, uh, on the TV at one march or another. She was the executive director of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, uh, which she left uh, just a little while ago, and is now writing probably what will turn out to be the most important book ever written about our movement, and we're going to talk a little bit about Thanks that, too. Thanks for the pressure, she <laughs> 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 I don't feel pressure. it. Are you kidding? I just sold you about nine million copies here. So welcome, Kate and Irv. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Kate and Irv have been together in, I guess, what we call in our community a couple. Uh, I think we do anyway still, really? since 1988, yes. which I think in our community is also a long-term relationship, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we both know people who've been together at least eight years. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to make fun of anything, <clears throat> but I might. I, I don't promise anything. I um, wanted to talk a little bit in this first part of the show about, about politics, something very close to both of your hearts. Uh, Irv, let me start asking you, what, what do you mean when you say the politics of our movement? Or what, so what comes under the general rubric of politics for you? Well, it, what I'm trying to write about is the, the future um, and where we're going and whether the strategies that we've employed to win the cultural space that we have won this far are going to carry us through the 90s into the next millennium. Um, so the politics of our movement it, to me are about our goals, our vision of the world we want to create, um, the way we structure our movement, the way we do business with each other. We're pretty new as a movement. Um, Very new. How did we get to this point of sudden visibility, do you think? Well, it, you know, the old axiom that everything that seems to have erupted all of a sudden actually has a long history is really true for us. It's We're seeing the emergence of gay and lesbian people uh, from silence in the closet. Um, because millions, literally millions of gay people at every level of life came out of the closet and started to organize around the discrimination and prejudice that we face. It's a movement that's been in existence formally for at least 40 years and in very small groups even longer than that. Yeah, I think that people, it's, it's not clear to people when we say sort of movement, because we always talk about the lesbian and gay community, like it's a big house we all live in or something, mm -hmm. you know, we are, or we are a family, it's, uh, <laughs> I think you've said yes. several times, Kate. We overuse song, but <laughs> it's sort of an anthem. <laughs> so uh, how did we get from this community to this movement? I mean, how, um, I think that gay people st started to politically organize. Now, I place a lot of uh, credit on the political movement, and I probably am a minority viewpoint in the movement in that regard, or in the community in that regard. Um, I, I think there's a tendency to dismiss the gay political movement because the organizations are really small, or it seems like it's a handful of people doing it with smoke and mirrors. But I'll tell you, that handful has produced enormous results. Well, there was like a million people at the march, yeah. at least by our count. And mm -hmm. the thing that makes gay the gay liberation movement so unique is that we organize on every single front that we find discrimination. So you've got gay teachers associations and gay doctors and gay lawyers and gay, you know, choral groups. There's cultural groups all over the place. There's like a really broad-based, decentralized movement. So today, you know, what looks like enormous visibility all of a sudden is actually all these little groups that have been or working in gay communities around the country. But they don't often see themselves as political, in a way. I mean, right. I don't know, when you were going around doing concerts, for mm -hmm. instance, there would be in the, in the basements of Unitarian churches. Do you think your audience is identified with a political movement? I, I don't think they necessarily did early on, in the early 80s, but I think that the very act of going to hear a lesbian comedian and getting together 
as lesbians was a very political act. And I think that what happened was the kind of political organizing that Irvishi was doing enabled people to see themselves in a different way, you know, and that kind of culture also fed the political. I mean, I think that I, when, after I met Irvishi, I started to take around a lot of political messages, a lot of her long speeches. I would try to get down to one, like <laughs> to a one, one to a joke. Yeah, <laughs> one joke. Okay. But, you know, I think that that's the way it has worked all along. The cultural and the political work has fed each other. And I think that you, you can't look at the current reality of gay people without um, noting that a couple of historical developments happened that catapulted us into enormous visibility. One was AIDS and the other was the right-wing backlash. I think both have, you know, had a tremendous effect on pulling people into politics and to getting people to realize that with AIDS, the government was not moving fast enough to save our lives and still isn't because of homophobia, because we are gay and bisexual people who are disproportionately affected by this epidemic in this country. There's I, I remember back in the old days when there seemed to be, you know, gay men who were having a lot of fun but not being very political, being a little more visible to some extent, maybe six or seven, than lesbians. Mm -hmm. Lesbians were the radical feminists of the feminist movement for the most part. We did grunge before grunge. <laughs> okay, I would just like, as a fashion statement. We didn't even know it was grunge. We, we, did, we, we thought were this way is, ahead of You know, people. you have one pair of this and one of these and <laughs> yeah. you wear them all the time. It was right, good. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and we didn't care very much about them, and they certainly didn't care very much about us. As a matter of fact, we were kind of scary. Mm -hmm. We were about upsetting the status quo, and to a great extent, many of the men in the closet were very invested in the status quo. Then came AIDS, right? Mm -hmm. How did AIDS become a lesbian issue? Well, I think that one of the ways it did was, uh, as the great gay and lesbian leader Ginny Apuzo once said, AIDS knitted us into a family. And I think that's a very powerful image. It brought us together on a very human level of taking care of each other um, and of working together in organizations and in creating aid service organizations and creating the political organizations to respond to this epidemic. That was one way, it was a very personal, personal way. Um, another way that, that AIDS brought lesbians and gay men together was that it, as gay men got more politicized, uh, they took on a lot of the um, agendas that the lesbians had been carrying. I mean, I've, I've noted for years that the feminist health agenda, which lesbians were working on, uh, became the gay health agenda mm -hmm. because of AIDS. Issues like welfare reform, insurance reform, disability rights. Access to health care. Access to health care. Um, all of these were le feminist health issues. The whole notion of self-help taking care of ourselves, which you know came out of lesbian feminism essentially in the 70s, became the foundation on which AIDS service organizations and gay and lesbian health clinics were built. Well, it seems like that's the basis of intersectionality. Intersectionality being, you know, do we recognize that there are gender issues and race issues intertwined with and sexual I, orientation? And I think that's what makes our politic a, a more transformational than just sort of the, you know, the, the maintaining the status quo kind of politics. In that juncture of that, all of those issues, I think, you know, that is where the transformation takes place. I'm interested now in, you know, how we're talking about the mainstream and, you know, and, and this is a very mainstream moment, but, you know, and this is, I mean, I've been written as the lesbian you could take home to your parents, you know, and then <laughs> and I would, <laughs> and, really and I'm carrying an Uzi, so well. be careful, you know, I mean, it's like, I, I, I'm, I think we're still profoundly radical and and interested in really transforming the systems we saw it in uh, in women's health care transforming how people were dealing with aids you know uh, i mean i think that's where that all comes together all those issues don't you think this whole talk about mainstreaming is a kind of way of defanging us i mean either we are too extreme or we are so vanilla that we're no danger at all and the hope is when you mainstream that you won't be rocking the boat mm -hmm. i mean speaking of streams and boats and mm -hmm. i don't know if that all fits and together those weekend dikes let's weekend talk about dikes. those you know that are <laughs> currently destroying the Midwest. Oh, I mean, of course. I see the, <laughs> the mainstream, rampaging yes. mainstream, and I think it's a perfect time that these all things come together. Well, I think we have to acknowledge that for many people in the lesbian and gay communities around the country, to be mainstreaming means simply being a part of and being able to live our lives as openly lesbian, gay, bisexual people. So in that, in that sense, the desire for mainstream um, 
uh, for a mainstream life is perfectly understandable. But the funny part is it's made like into a verb. <laughs> like we are being mainstreamed. And I guess the difference is we have always been part of the mainstream, just like we've always been part of the military and mm -hmm. everything. But now it seems as though someone, and I don't know whether it's people within the movement, I mean, I know the dialogue goes on, seems to feel that we ought to look more acceptable. I mean, with this notion of, are you complimented when people say, oh, now here's a lesbian you could take home to your mom? Not necessarily. I mean, I, you know, I think that I do have a, a very radical heart. I can't get past looking like a Campbell's Soup Kid. I've tried, <laughs> you know, I've tried, but it just doesn't work. But, uh, you know, I mean, there's a way that one longs to be accepted. And then it's really annoying when I when one is, you know. <laughs> and I think you're you're very you make a great point when you point out that we have always been there. In fact, mm -hmm. so ninety percent of what what is presented to us as mainstream culture is in fact could be looked at as gay and lesbian culture because the producers, the writers, the actors, the fashion designers are gay. And you know, in another in another world, in another life, maybe that would be looked at as, hmm, this is particularly astonishing. The gay contribution to culture is so profound. But but you see what I mean? With they're sort of trying to get us at both ends of this thing. Mm -hmm. Where it was in '87 at the at the march, it was all you know, all the drag queens and the leather dykes and the dykes on bikes and spikes and whatever it was going to be. And look how what a fringe they are. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden in '93, it's like, oh my God, look how normal. They look, and let's just focus on the one, the people from, with all apologies, to Kansas. Kansas, or whatever. <laughs> and the LA Times had a great editorial where they said, you know, let's not forget the drag queens and the people who mm -hmm. have been sort of the radical movers and shakers. I don't know who in the LA Times wrote this editorial, but it was great. Like, let's not push that out of sight because now we want them to look so normal. Well, so I think there'll be a swing. I mean, maybe we need one more march. You know, we're, we're uh, with everybody there. yeah, with everybody there that covers all of the wide spectrum and the continuum of gay and lesbian culture. I mean, I, I think that we're still trying to identify, and for going to stay with the main, mainstream idea, it's still a very, very fluid uh, thing. That's what I've always enjoyed about our culture. I kind of resent being pinned down. You know, I think that is one of the beauties of who we are, and that's part of the, like, the transformational idea. W will we talk about sex? We will at some point. Yeah, Wait. personal. That's a, okay. We have to oh, save that, third, of course, okay, for the third, third part second. of the program, yeah. so that the audience stays uh -huh. with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the trick. Oh. Oh. But the other we piece. Will be talking about that. I, mean, I mean, the other thing I think is important for us to remember in this time, when we face such a enormous visibility, that people could get complacent about it, mm -hmm. is that there's nothing to be complacent about. Discrimination remains rampant against gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. Prejudice is real and growing. Um, we need more education, education, and more education for every age group all over the country to counteract the misinformation that still exists about who we are. And um, so complacency is, is something that I worry about as we make the cover of, of various magazines, which I think is critical. I mean, don't get me wrong. This media moment is doing more to, to produce this kind of education. Well, you can be two dykes with a kid on the cover of Newsweek. That doesn't mean it's real easy when you go to get the daycare. Well, or when you well, tell the teacher either one of us is her mother. But Sheila, know. even before that, it doesn't mean that it's possible for gay people to have kids. Even though there's two lesbians with a kid on the cover of Newsweek, there's enormous barriers that women and men face to adoption, foster care, to even maintaining custody of our children. There are huge discrimination issues in that arena alone, and that's just one. Violence, the military policy, I mean, um, AIDS discrimination and that, that, ex that people face all over the country who are gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. It just goes on and on. Well, and it's I interesting. How I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, my only, my appeal, if there's one like propaganda pitch that I can make in, uh, using this show, which goes out to so many people around the country, is that we have to get more involved in our movement. It is not one. The battle is far from one. It is finally being waged in a very serious and intense way. And this is a life and death battle for each and every one of us. And for us to be complacent and say, well, they're doing it in Washington, or somebody's taking care of this is simply wrong. Every single person has a role to play, gay or straight. And I don't think that people really know how much joy there is in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't it? It's not only just fun, but joyful. Now, yeah. you know, speaking as someone who, this is my whole life. I mean, doing stuff, activism, advocacy is my whole life, and I think it's joyful. But I know people have said, 
they did one little thing. They've gone to a meeting or, mm -hmm. you know, they've mm -hmm. spoken up or they appeared on uh, local access in the, you know, Burbank or whatever, and they were so happy they could not believe how happy they felt or even coming out. Exactly. Which, of course, especially is, coming out. Yeah. And then there's the next, and then you like, th you think, well, that was wonderful, but then you take the next step and it just keeps going and it really is it's probably addictive there'll probably be groups about it but you know I, it, oh i'm oh, sure geez i hope not but I, it's They'll try really to take that fun away from us too as i said yeah. but it really is if i may say empowering it's just a kick and you know and you know we met each other in the movement mm -hmm. in yes, the so called you can find a relationship <laughs> in the movement at the war conference yeah you can meet babes war Go there and meet babes, babes. <laughs> lesbian cheeks, uh, chicks, or whatever, and whatever. Um, the second thing you said s sort of brought us together was about fighting the right, and I want to talk about that a little bit in, mm. in this part too, or or whatever. <laughs> the right. This no. is it, huh? <laughs> the left was no, no. mistake. <laughs> Dig it. Uh, well, we're not the first people that had to do this. We are not the first, and we won't be the last. Um, what I think we misunderstand the right when we uh, try to lump them into the kooky fringe. This is not a fringe phenomena. It's about a whole value system and a movement and a politically organized movement behind a set of values. And the value system is essentially about establishing a Christian supremacist state. That's what I believe. It's that when you listen to the, when you strip it all down with Pat Robertson and Falwell and the Christian Coalition and Phyllis Schlafly and their many manifestations of the right are all talking about is doing away with the separation of church and state. They are talking about imposing one code of morality based on the Old Testament. They're talking about a very, very different world than one that I think most people in this country are comfortable living in. I believe in a secular state which means, you know, a non-religious state that is guided by principles like that are embodied in the Constitution. And that is exactly what is being jeopardized. We, gay and lesbian people, are just the cannon fodder in this war. We're just the tools. And it's a, we're great tools because we're very, you know, we, we provoke, Long history we we provoke a lot of reaction right. mm -hmm. among good people. Well, we have to take a break now, but what I'd like to do is show you a little bit of Irv speaking to the masses, actually, <laughs> at the wonderful wa uh, March on Washington that we all just went to last April. Listen to Irv speak. America, this day marks the return from exile of the gay and lesbian people. We are banished no more. We wander the wilderness of despair no more. We are afraid no more. For on this day, with love in our hearts, we have come out, and we have come out to reach out across America to build a bridge of understanding, a bridge of progress, a bridge as solid as steel, a bridge to a land where no one suffers prejudice, because of their sexual orientation, their race, their gender, their religion, or their human difference. I've been asked by the march organizers to speak in five minutes about the far right. The far right which threatens the construction of this bridge. The extremist right which has targeted every one of you and me for extinction. The supremacist right, which seeks to redefine the very meaning of democracy. Language itself fails in this task, my friends, for to call our opponents the right states a profound untruth. They are wrong. They are wrong. They are wrong morally. They are wrong spiritually. And they are wrong politically. The Christian supremacists are wrong spiritually when they demonize us. They are wrong when they reduce the complexity and beauty of our spirit into a freak show. They are wrong spiritually because if we are the untouchables of America, if we are the untouchables, then we are, as Mahatma Gandhi said, children of God. And as God's children, 
We know that the gods of our understanding, the gods of goodness and love and righteousness march right here with us today. The things that I had been taught about homosexuality didn't compute as far as looking at my own son and saying, well, he is not these things that society has told me. I really got helped at the PFLAG meeting. I, uh, they helped me tremendously. We went. We knew that we needed help. We met wonderful, wonderful people. It was really a fantastic experience. Don't let fear control your life. Call us now. I'm glad I have a lesbian daughter. Otherwise, I wouldn't know all of you wonderful people, and I wouldn't have had this enriching experience. You think Irv is funny. Here's Kate. One percent. We didn't believe that for a second, did we? No, and if there were one percent of American males are gay, I'm telling you, every last one of them was at the March on Washington. Wouldn't you say? Uh, well, I guess there were three queens left in the village, actually, in New York. They had opera tickets. They couldn't get out of it. Do you know? So, um, that, now, you all went, didn't you? Was it all? Oh, so wonderful. Just wonderful. And didn't you love how they immediately went into how many people were there? And what, were they, what did they end up with? 300,000. Oh, please. But see, I knew there was going to be this problem. Because this was the March on Washington for gay, lesbian, and bisexual rights. I said, we've got to decide about this bisexual thing. If it's going to half the number or double the number of people, we've got to figure this out. <laughs> sort of like a gay math word problem, isn't it? Uh, Welcome back to Get Used To It. My guests today are Kate Clinton and Irvish Vad. And uh, Kate, I wanted to ask you, in, in terms of the work that you do and have been doing for 12 years since you're 13 years old, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it in trimesters. <laughs> Why did you decide to do stand-up? <laughs> well, uh, and lesbian stand-up, great career move, huh? <laughs> Twelve years ago. Right, we can see. Yes, you know, all the, uh, it was accolades. sort of a national. It was sort of a, a national and natural progression. From uh, I taught high school English for eight years, and you oh, and, and good that's a comedy. Funny business, yeah. People say to me, "Did you did you do the comedy club thing?" And I said, "No, I taught high school English." And they go, "Say no more." <laughs> um, but I really, I was coming out, and and I. I was having so much fun I couldn't really teach anymore. I would go to school and have this big smile on my face and everyone was jealous. And so I took a leave of absence and during that time I started to write tortured poetry and <laughs> would go with the women's writing group and read this poetry and, um, and I was like the backup, uh, the last uh, reader and by that time everybody was just like so bored and I would, so I would make people laugh with my poet, my serious poetry and then <laughs> somebody said, well, uh, well then one day I thought, well I could try it more directly and a friend of mine said, you know, I'm sick of hearing you uh, talk about you want to be a stand-up comedian, uh, that you want to try it, so I've booked you at a club and she had booked me at a, a women's club in Syracuse and that's where I started. And I was coming out at the time so that's what I talked about. I think if I'd been in, you know, uh, maybe in bombing school, that's what I would have talked about, and we can be happy that I was coming out, and, and that was my material. We're happy. <laughs> um, was there a whole network of sort of women's uh, coffee houses, festivals, all that kind of stuff that you became mm -hmm. connected to? The late 80s, or the early 80s, was at the end of the flowering, I think would say, of the lesbian uh, women's cultural network, and, and there were still a lot of uh, coffee houses, very active uh, production collectives. The Midwest especially, I sort of, I think I grew up in the Midwest in church basements there. And there was the, the festivals were the festival in Michigan and then other festivals grew and, and included comedy finally. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's where I got my training. But you know, that, that whole um, piece of our lives as lesbians is is, was a very big part of, I know my life too, mm -hmm. um, women's culture, uh, you know, Olivia Records, Redwood Records, all the women's productions that were happening. And there used to be hundreds of lesbian producers in all the medium-sized mm -hmm. and small cities. Women on Wheels? And mm -hmm. Sure, or down in St. Louis, Tomato Productions, which uh -huh. uh, Sue Hyde and Chris Kleindienst uh -huh. ran in the mm -hmm. early 70s. And it was just very, very uh, so rich. So is that an important part of building a movement? I mean, we talk, people sort of give lip service to the notion that, oh yeah, c uh, culture, and then they talk about gay culture, and I, now maybe even lesbian culture. 
But what, what's the connection then between sort of movement politics and culture, culture work? Well, you know, I don't think I'd be doing the political work I do now if it hadn't been for the culture that I was introduced to. Now, when Urvashi talks about the culture that was very important to her, during that time, I was a straight high school English teacher, you know, and so I just kind of, I was like just to the left of Newt Gingrich most of that time, and so I went, I listened to music, I was transformed. And through that transformation, I began to do the political work that I do now. So I, I think it's just, it's absolutely critical. One feeds the other. And the other thing is that when people say gay culture these days, they, they really do mean gay male culture. Mm -hmm. And you almost have to look at it in parallel tracks to borrow a, met a metaphor from another arena because gay male culture is a real phenomenon and there is a whole a rich tradition there, but so is lesbian culture, and that history has yet to be written. Uh, well, I think the notion, I mean, for me, in terms of women's music, what happened, and it was also transformational for me, I, I think when I was in law school, hmm. at the le end of the 70s, kind of, or mid-70s, Yep. Um, and the transformation really came from a recognition of oneself for the first time, you know, to see this, to see this, to hear someone talking about loving women, it's like, Gosh, I mean, there was an expression to it, and it was beautiful. Yeah. And to read, I mean, I, I can still remember where I was when I read The Dream of a Common Language and mm -hmm. Audrey mm -hmm. Rich, and when I read her essays, and when I read for a recovering Catholic like myself, Mary Daly was very, very important. Right. Beyond God the Father. <laughs> Beyond. Wow. I mean, I remember Great book. Like, Gain ecology. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. just remember the top of my head taken off and scrambled up really good. And at the same time, seeing finally what 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 I'd been thinking you know that I I mean I went through college when there was no women's studies and I always wondered what was so you know quintessentially American about hunting a white whale I mean there was no <laughs> you know like, there was nothing for me so when I started to read whale and, envy was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey that's a great joke no the origin of Greenpeace <laughs> <laughs> Green peace, that's good, I like that, okay. <laughs> but that's where it came, I mean, that's where I was really, that part of the reading sort of literate culture was what really turned me around. And I, I It was so invisible how narrow it was. I mean, we didn't even, did you ever think about how, you may have, I don't know, but I never did about what was missing. Like, I was missing in all the stuff mm -hmm. I was reading or listening to or whatever. So, yeah. well, now you're both cultural workers, really, because I, I think the point of writing a book is, uh, it's not just history, is it, Irv? I mean, no, it's no. not what your book's really about. I don't know what it's about. Yeah, you know, read it and weep. I don't know. It'll no, be a I blast. want everybody to carry it. <laughs> yeah, Kate has a little this, red Mao book. She has this <laughs> image of gay pride now marches what do we do? <laughs> with Irv's book. Oh, I like it. A little more it? pressure. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I live with this. <laughs> well, it is a lot of pressure, though, isn't it? I mean, uh, people have a lot of, first of all, they, they see you speak, they read what you've written, and they say, uh, Irvishy Vad is the Socrates of our movement. <laughs> Several people have said this to me, which makes you the Aristophanes of our movement, I think. Oh, that, <gasps> who oh. was that? Oh, that was good. <laughs> Did you I know, do Lysistrata? <laughs> that was good. To, okay. That was good stuff. <laughs> but, he had good stuff. But it is a kind of pressure to, to try to synthesize, to meet people's expectations. But all of that aside, wh wh sort of what is the, what do you hope the book will do? Enlighten and motivate would be the best I could hope for. Um, at this, some days I just hope for coherent sentences on a page. <laughs> Other days I hope for movie rights. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Sheila. You know, I think that the the, the question about culture and and the way culture moves people. Um, I think I started to feel a real hunger for the space to think and reflect when I was doing activist work. There just isn't time for that. I mean, my heart goes out to every single person who works in an aid service organization, a gay and lesbian organization, who's volunteering, because it takes so much energy to keep even the smallest chorus alive, mm -hmm. to keep a show like this on the air. It's just a huge amount of energy is being expended by people in a very crisis-driven uh, situation. You know, it's like very intense. Um, pressure that we all face to not be there, to not be seen, and to not be heard. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I'm really grateful to have the space and the time to think uh, and reflect. And that's kind of what culture, I mean, it's reconnecting me to a part of my own personal history, 
which was very much about cultural political work. Um, I was for years involved in a group in Washington called Roadwork, mm -hmm. which produced a women's music festival called Sister Fire, which was the only urban open to everybody, come on down and see the babes, <laughs> women's music festival, which was also rooted in, deeply rooted in anti-racist politics. It really tried to make the mash of issues come together in a really organic way through the artists and poets and writers and activists that we presented. And that work changed me. And I saw how it changed people. Any speech I give has this much effect. I think one of Kate's jokes opens mm -hmm. people's minds more than, you know, five hours of polemic, five hours of C-SPAN. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> it cumulatively might well, equal a, one joke. But well, I, th I think that, you know, the thing is that it's all part of the same movement forward, you know, whatever it takes. I mean, people reading your book, somebody hearing, you know, taking a one-liner that they can use to work, you know, that they've heard at my show that works for them at work, then, you know, I think it all, it's all part of the moving us along and moving us forward. Well, this is that notion about the tracks that I see as sort of d strategic tracks, where in a movement to say, well, what is the strategy of the movement seems to me to be kind of a silly question because it's a lot of strategies. Mm -hmm. It's one person coming out, you know, to their boss. It's a million people marching in Washington. Both of those things, to some extent, need to be organized or there needs to be a welcoming or safe mm -hmm. place to do that. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's, that's exciting today is that because we have women's bookstores and gay and lesbian bookstores all over the country, you can find many more people, you can find the culture. It's, it's more identifiable. And what I'm, what I'm excited by this show and others, uh, you know, uh, other, where people are talking, I think that what I'm excited about seeing is like a culture of conversation. You know, I think that too long we've thought, well, I saw it on television, therefore, you know, I thought about it or I talked about it. But I think that what I've loved about being with Irvishi is, <laughs> is that I've met a lot of her friends and all they do is talk. <laughs> I mean, they just talk about ideas, which is Oh, honey, been... I never thought you liked that. <laughs> <laughs> She's always saying, can you just... Stop! <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's really critically important. Of course, my family didn't really talk that much, so it was like, you know, you know the old saying? And my mom would go, yeah. I mean, it was like, yeah, you know. <laughs> don't ask, don't much tell was invented for her family. family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think that what when we were talking about fundamentalism earlier, I think one of the dangers for our movement is a kind of fundamentalism mm. in our own movement. And I think what it stems from is really a longing for an answer, for once and for all we know what to do, you know. And I think that what gay people know is how to live with the fluidity of not one answer, you know, that we just, we make it up as we go along in a lot of ways. And, and I think that that's one of the beauties of the movement and that's what excites me. I mean, I'm really excited by the comedians that are coming along, the culture that is coming along. I'm excited by the fact that it is very co-gender, you know, and I, I've been performing in, in Los Angeles at Highways, which is a wonderful gay and lesbian performance space, and for the first time in a long time ever, in coming to my shows are like 40 percent men, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I don't know what's happened, <laughs> but I'm happy about it, you know, because I think that we have been working together for a very long time, and now it's time that we can, like, share entertainment. And I think what's happened is that men aren't as afraid of coming to what they, I don't know what they thought I was going to do to them, you know. Well, I, I don't think there's any, I think gay men have suffered to some extent from the same kind of sexism mm -hmm. as straight men, which is they think that being a lesbian is about hating men. And what we found in working together is that, you know, like you said, who has time? <laughs> I mean, this is not, this is the one thing in the world that's not about men, okay? It's about <laughs> us. <laughs> it's about us Ooh. loving each other well. But, you know, and, but it feels non-threatening, mm -hmm. I think, once you sort of get used to it. I think a lot of what we're both in right now, and, and when you asked me earlier what my book is really about, I, I returned to that Adrian Rich book. My, I, I feel like we're, we're interested in the dream of a common movement, the dream of that common ground that Jesse Jackson talked about in 1988 in that fabulous speech at the Democratic Convention, you know, oh, which just, <laughs> oh, that was a great moment, but that's another story. Um, but I don't think we, we, we're in a moment of balkanization, you know, where everybody is particularized into their own little identities and their own, and we're very invested in our identities. But I think the, the, the transcendence is what I'm interested in, and I think what Kate and other cultural workers like you who do political work 
are aiming at and bringing us to. It's that we have a lot of things in common. Whether we're straight, gay, black, or white, there is something that, that is about creating a new world that should inspire us and motivate us. And it's not just one answer. When you were talking about this, I, I see this as a deep desire for an alternative to what the right wing and, the, and some of the rest of the world have been saying about us. And there is this sort of hope that there will be an answer, and yet the notion of intersectionality in the movement and with our movement and other movements and in the world is that there's a multiplicity of answers. I mean, this notion they try to use political correctness mm -hmm. as though it's a terrible thing because you have to decide as a community on one answer. And essentially, mm -hmm. we're saying no. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> we're finding our way through a lot of different tracks and, and pieces of the community. Mm -hmm. Multiculturalism never meant one answer. It meant multi, hello. You know? <laughs> right. And it, it never meant having one of each. It meant identifying that you have each in one. You know? Yo. And... <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's really good. Don't forget the pencils and papers it's out because there's a lot of this it going on It is the on multiplicity here. in the one. I mean, it's like when I get, one of the exciting things about a show for me is when I can say one joke and everyone laughs at it and they all have their own reasons. Like mm -hmm. there is the multiplicity and the unity at that very moment. I think and it's, a, it's like a hint of what culture and community actually is, that we are one and yet we are able, well able to sustain a multiplicity, I mean, of individual people. I think that's what this is about. It's a longing to be understood as an individual and we don't have time anymore. And I mean, it's like... On another level, that's why I think the right is so successful because they try to provide a framework that everybody can see themselves in and fit into. I think that's what we've got to provide to the country and of to the world. Of course, they were all about one answer. I mean, that's what fascism is. Mm -hmm. I mean, a fasc is a bundle of sticks, all cut to the same size and bound together. Hmm. That's what a fasc is, and fascism comes from that notion of everybody cut to the same size doing the same thing. Wow. But now we have to go to a break, so let's see just what it is that makes Kate so funny. <laughs> There have always been gays in the military. We haven't been allowed to design uniforms. I think that's quite clear, don't you think? We would not have stayed with the earth tone thing that long, I can tell you. A nice crisp blue in here would be very nice. Out of here. And those, oh, those joint chiefs of staff. I mean, their tits were in a spin, weren't they? Oh, right away, they were like, if there are gays in the military, it will destroy the military. Good. <laughs> Good. Why are we wasting money on arms? Apparently, like a flaming queen in the Iraqi army, hello, and poof, there would go the whole army. They'd be like, we're sorry, we surrender. No problem. We're, or a, a nice dyke in big square pocketed pants. <laughs> Because you like to see your thighs move, you know? We could do, apparently destroy an army, not a shot fired. I think that's incredible. I'm not afraid to make a commitment. Here's Sawaya. I'm not afraid to make the commitment. No tengo miedo a hacer la promesa. Nanen yaksogan en gosil chiriawa ja ansimida. Make the commitment for a drug-free world. Because we saw the Democrats could suck up to Hollywood as good as the Republicans ever did. I mean, people were going, well, we were at the Arkansas ball and the one and only Barbara Streisand was there. And I was like, hey, I was at the gay ball. You only had one Barbara Streisand. <laughs> we had three Barbara Streisand. Hi, welcome back to Get Used to It. Kate, you are so funny. And now <laughs> the whole world knows it. Uh, of course, everybody always knew it. Uh, well, here we are into the good stuff. Remember, we promised that we were going to talk about sex. But you don't have to, but I, as, a, as a sex radical, I know this is an important issue to you, Irv. I thought this was a family show. I'm appalled. We are all family, but this is the I family that has sex. Haven't around. you heard about oh. this community? <laughs> right. Um, People are interested, obviously, when two high-profile, really active, long-time activists get together. And you've been together for five years. And I guess one question, in terms of your relationship, does it make the work more difficult, less difficult, sort of the individual work you do? And I don't know. 
she, she's turning to me. <laughs> That's <laughs> good. Like first that. time I've ever been able to talk. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, honey, you're the the here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the top here, so I'll start. Uh, well, I think that Go first ahead, of all, tell the world. <laughs> I think first of all that um, one of the, the most attractive things about Irvishi has been her mind to me. I mean, I think the mind is a very sexy thing, and we shouldn't be wasted. So, um, you know, I think that that was one of the first things that attracted to me, besides her finger, but fingers, <laughs> but you, well, it's a whole other topic, but um, in fact, what's <laughs> happened... You can explain that one, too. Okay. No, maybe not. No, okay. okay. Aim high. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but actually, what, what, and of course, I love her body as well, but I, one of the exciting things that has really fueled our relationship, I think, is our political passions. And, and it has been so wonderful to have, um, you know, a place to talk about it, a place to, to explore ideas. And it, it, that, I think, is one of the things that has fueled our relationship. It has certainly fueled my work. I mean, you know, I think that I have a lot more substance to the work that I did. I mean, I could always get a laugh. But now to be able to get a laugh with a serious uh, idea that people are left with has been really important to my work. And I think, you know, I think too, if I may say, I think that one of the things that I've helped Irvishi with is to not take it so seriously. I mean, to be able to laugh. And no one laughs harder at her own jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when I'm you first started making it. You know? I know. Well, meeting Kate was really just changed my life, and I'm happy to say that and proud to say that. I mean, I think you did teach me how to laugh at the people in Washington who take themselves so dully seriously. And it's the biggest, most powerful thing you can do is just to laugh. Oh, please, Blarney Frank, give me a break. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Every one of them, our own as well as their own. Um, but... I also told you that I, I, I thought that, that the um, relationship, sometimes it suffers because we're such driven people about our work. And it's the classic thing in some ways about the career and family Can kind of dichotomy. Family? Can you have a career and a well, family? And you were trying to do it in two different states or cities. Yeah. Or, I mean, mm -hmm. We should have been given commercials. <laughs> we should have been, you know, the poster <laughs> children for AT&T. I mean, <laughs> we, we spent so much money on, on long distance phone bills before we came, we they started just recently together. moved in together, Very right? creative scheduling for a number of years. Um. And uh, recently we did move in with each other. We were, we had the, the ceremony was called the mingling of the t-shirts. <laughs> <And, laughs> we're going to celebrate and, it every year. And, and as we yeah. were doing it, I turned to Rishi and said, do you think we're doing this too fast? <laughs> <laughs> After five and a half years. <laughs> well, long distance her. is, is it, but it seriously is a different thing, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think sometimes when we're in the middle of discussions, uh, we actually think of going to different places and talking on the phone about it, because that's where <laughs> we were used to working on problems and, um. and processing. And, and sometimes it's difficult to do it face to face. But I, I really don't think that it, I could be doing the work that I'm doing if I weren't in this relationship. I mean, and so I'm really willing, happy and willing to work on it. You know, and it is a lot of work. Every relationship is. Every, it's a truism to say it. It sounds so trite and cliche, but it is. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know. What else can I tell you? We're not used to talking about our relationship. We kind Except of... Except over the phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, to other people. <laughs> or especially, This is really well, the first public I, I time we've talked together. I guess one of the other things that, that I believe is that when you're out there in the world fighting, whether you're doing work within the community, which is difficult, or whether you're doing systems change work somewhere else, which is difficult. You need a safe space. You need a place that is safe and, you know, it doesn't mean you always agree on absolutely everything, but it has to be safe even when you disagree. Is that, do you feel as though that's created within your relationship? Mm -hmm. I mean, does it feel safe? It, it feels really supportive. And I've gotten, I mean, Kate's crediting me for some work in, in her life, but, you know, that March on Washington speech, um, I was really stuck on it. I was stuck. I couldn't get anything going. I couldn't get an idea out if you paid me. And we had a conversation, and it just kind of opened up a whole way of thinking about the situation, and I wrote it down the next morning. And I think that, that that's what you're talking about, a place to have conversations and bring back ideas. Um, I think actually the quite the commonality of a relationship, the very common com kind of work that we do, that lesbians do, that gay men do in relationships is really one of the, the terrifying things 
to people who, first of all, can't believe that gay uh, couples, lesbian couples, are kind of like have fights about the laundry. Have, I mean, it's like really boring stuff. I think that they can't believe it, and they can believe it, and that's what really terrifies them about it. I'm often just shocked at how mundane life actually is, even if you're gay. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> You know, I know. It's not all on this higher vinegar, plane. Honey, in this salad dressing. <laughs> so you're not sitting there having all these intellectual conversations <laughs> all the time as America imagines yeah, you fighting are. fighting over the clicker on the TV, <laughs> you know? She likes football. Uh huh. She loves football. Love it. <laughs> and you? Uh, I have grown to love. I've really grown to love. You better. I like the. <laughs> you better say. I love it, uh, but I miss Murphy Brown. I'll tell you. Oh, that. and I have had the indignity of having to watch every tired comedian in the world. <laughs> oh God! But Cable. it's researcher. It's okay. It's research. Well, it's homework, you know. <laughs> you know, one of the things that there, there's been a long-standing joke about lesbians and sex. That is the sort of the absence of interest in it, or how it dies after a while. The sort of the uh, the uh, theory in our community, yeah. etc. But I know that in, in your own way and the way you talk in your work and the way, certainly the way you've always talked in terms of sort of the political importance of us and, and the kind of revolutionary uh, ideas we can bring to America. How, do, how does this also integrate as a notion in your work? And I don't know what else to ask. I certainly won't ask terribly personal questions. But. Well, I mean, I, I think that one of the She's hardest yeah. things. I know. <laughs> I couldn't even. I don't know how to get into this <laughs> subject without giving it all away. <laughs> okay, go. But uh, on, I want to respond in two ways. One is that I. Th it's in in terms of the. Oh, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I'm gonna get tongue tied. <laughs> You've called me a sex radical, and I can't <laughs> talk about sex. I do think that that sex and sexuality is a very integral part of who we are as lesbians and gay men, and, and it's a part of our relationship, just as it's the part of any successful relationship. Um, and it's, it's, I think we do have to talk about it because the right talks about it in a very negative and pejorative way. And in some ways, I think that we are just like heterosexuals in that, in that sense that it's, if, it, if it's not working in the relationship, it's not gonna, the relationship is not gonna work. Um, on another level, I think that, that gay sexuality is very threatening to so many people. Um, and why is that? Why is the sight of two women kissing or two men kissing still evoke ewes in movie theaters all over this country? Mm -hmm. You know, every time you see that image, people are freaked out about it. I think part of it is that people aren't just familiar. And, and part of it is the erotophobia of this society. We're a sex-hating culture. And that's an ironic thing to say when we're fed sex and advertising and this horrible, vicious, you know, inhumane sexuality that is put out on commercial television. Well, it's the deformation of sex, in a sense. Yeah. It's all, all the kind of sex we're sold is deformed. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, to make it seem legitimate, they have to characterize us as deformed sex or unnatural or whatever. It's, I mean, they define us by that and then make it be outside the so-called circle of acceptability. It's just a tool of, I think, of of difference that they use and happens to be the one they use against us. But we can't just say, it's just like the other stuff we were talking about, we can't just say, oh no, we're just the same as you, except we make love to people of the same sex. Because that's not really true, is it? We're not really just the same as straight people. I think there's a, we have a greater sense of pleasure and, and we are about the freeing up of eros and pleasure, the pleasure principle in, in the world. And we have a great deal of joy about sexuality that um, I think heterosexual America could really benefit from. <laughs> and as a recovering Catholic, where, I mean, I say, you know, that the two lines in my family were, you know, sex is dirty, save it for someone you love. <laughs> 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 you know, to actually, I mean, and, and to be completely warm, warned against uh, heterosexual sex, and then to have the, the other layer of homosexual sex, I mean, it has been a work to, you know, to get through. And, and it took about, I think about five minutes, actually, just the sheer, <laughs> just to break the, the sheer pleasure, you know. I mean, oh. I think that there is a way that the skin, there is the way of the, the brushing of the arm against, I mean, there's a, there's a way that you just cannot, cannot ignore it.
that... Well, that must be very powerful to control then. I mean, that's why the you religious need right wants to control yeah. it. You need big buildings. <laughs> big buildings. Mm -hmm. Big buildings to control the mm -hmm. whole thing. And you got to have big, uh, big uh, rites and uh, big ceremonies to make sure that it's only heterosexuals that get to do it this one way. And you, and, you know, one of the hardest things for us as gay people is to get over the shame that we have internalized and we have been taught about feeling how we feel. We, you know, we feel sexual attraction to people of the same sex. There's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. And generally it sort of, it feels, at least in the sort of lesbian culture, it feels some, mostly non-exploitative, which makes it very unfamiliar. Because most of what you see in public about sex is very exploitative, mm -hmm. mostly men exploiting women. I mean, this whole thing about gays in the military, in my opinion, is simply straight men having this horrible fantasy that they're now going to be treated as badly as they've always treated women. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And the other, you know, the other thing is that we see um, the Christian right uses this videotape called the gay agenda very effectively and in it they spew out a whole host of lies and, and as you say, deform uh, the joy and the beauty of our lives in this really hideous way. Well, I've often wanted to make a tape called a straight agenda yeah, sure. in which you take the worst aspects of heterosexual life and hold them up and say, or the most common aspect. Or the most common. Oh, really, yeah, excuse a public me. heterosexual, sort of whatever the hickeys. sexual display is. <laughs> hickeys. A lot of hickeys. I was thinking more hickeys. of, you know, <laughs> incest and, and abuse and child abuse and, you know, domestic violence and rape and batter. I mean, you could hold those examples up, which are very common and a deep part of heterosexual dysfunction. Well, that's part of the sort of magician's act, which is we've got all this reality here and it's really terrible, so don't look at this hand. Mm -hmm. Oh, Look over here, which is really sort of gays and lesbians and how terrible they are. And the other thing is we're t our sexuality is often taken out of context. You know, gay and lesbian prides are celebrations. They are celebrations. So to take them and, and hold them up and say, oh my God, they're celebrating sex. I mean, I just want to say, uh-huh, and on to the next thing. You know, instead of getting all defensive about it, which I think a lot of us activists do, we get very freaked out when we see this representation of our, of our lives, which in many ways is real, and in other ways is completely I mean, it false. Would be, yeah, it would be like if we did spring break and yeah. said, this is, you know, this is heterosexual. That's a perfect This high break. level of testosterone. <laughs> spring or, break. No, it's MTV, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, or any music video. Right, right. right. So. Well, the, the other thing, though, is because we've been characterized as outlaws, mostly because, uh, only because of sexual behavior, really, it also gives us the opportunity, to some extent, to be outlaws and to imagine the unimaginable. I mean, I think that it's our community that's characterized as pushing the edge of whatever envelope there is around sexual practice. Mm -hmm. uh, no one can imagine a marriage of three people. Yet, uh, my question is, why not? It would seem to me to be, you know, financially much more secure. <laughs> You know, why do we have just dualities? And even in our community, we go, without meaning any disrespect to your twosome here, um, Sheila. we're sort of stuck in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, is she trying to feel something? No. Three, so, excuse me. One, two, three. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was your know. gay agenda. <laughs> Not, I don't know. not I mean, at all. No, no, like I'm totally respectful. <laughs> well, Sheila, you know, you, I mean, you say a very heretical and radical thing, and I'm sure you'll see yourself on a videotape by the moral majority. <laughs> I've saying already been this. on a videotape because I saw the gay agenda, and I saw me and Tori Osborne dancing, and this was women dancing with women. <laughs> yes, yeah. there we are. <laughs> Need on television. But I think you're absolutely right. I mean, in terms of what we were, I was talking about earlier about transforming. I mean, these are things that possibly can be looked at, you know, that, or tried. Uh, I can't imagine who's got the time to work on a threesome, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, balancing three careers. I've like, never met a threesome oh, that works ever. The scheduling would be unbelievable. But, so I mean, we're not the, radical enough. Maybe. The transgender uh, questions and, and people pushing that envelope. I mean, I think that this late uh, in the, the 1900s, I think we will, somebody will look back and go, wasn't that cute? They were trying that gay, lesbian, and straight thing. Who knows what right. will have transpired by then? I think we're in a very evolutionary moment. I mean, I don't think that the definitions, I mean, I get, you know, I was like really upset by, you know, that article about queer, straight queers or whatever it was in the mm -hmm. village voice. I thought, oh no, you know, and, and queer, and I was like, oh God, we've just gotten people used to saying lesbian without spitting on 
up and now we're going into this, you know. I mean, I think it, it is a kind of like there's an old folky kind of curmudgeon lesbian in me, but things are changing, you know. That's just all, and it's always going to be that way. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not interested in locking the definitions. I know what I'm comfortable with at this point. You know, and what, <laughs> so that I can do my work, what I'm comfortable with in a relationship. In a very profound way, I think what we're about is freedom. And that's a really powerful word. And, um, you know, and it's, and the other thing I wanted to say was that Carmen Vasquez, who's this brilliant Latina lesbian up in San Francisco, said to me that she thought that the, the two buttons we push the most in terms of straight society's reaction to us are the buttons of gender betrayal and erotophobia. I mean, she says that we, because we blend, we, we, we break down the whole rigid boundaries of gender. Oh, this is what a woman looks like. Oh, this is what a man looks like. This is what you're supposed to do. We blow them apart. We lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender people. That's a huge part of who we are and why we're so threatening. And the other thing that's so threatening about us is that we celebrate sexuality. Mm -hmm. We say it's a really big part of human beings. We believe in sexuality as a good force. Not every expression, not violent sexuality, not horrible, you know, it's consensual sexuality that we're talking about and um, liberated sexuality. Well, I can't believe the whole hour has gone by already. Oh, but it no, has, and, and I didn't even uh, get my, my Elizabeth Cady Stanton quote in, but okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you want to do it real no, no, fast? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, that been, was a joke. <laughs> it's been wonderful having you both here. I mean, Thank it's you. just great. Really lucky for LA that you were both here at the same time. Lucky for you that you were both in the same city mm -hmm. at the same time. Oh, very nice. Hallelujah. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, Betty. Thank you, Irv. Hi, Betty. <laughs> Thank you all, and remember to tune in to the show whenever you can because you really need to get used to it. It's an old building block of our movement coming out. And people did it, and there were incredible stories of courage. And one of the stories I heard was about this, this guy, a plane's flying out of Portland, Oregon. The flight attendant announces that she thinks they're overbooked and asks for volunteers. This guy goes up and volunteers. She said, well, just give me your last name. So he takes his, his name, and she said, what's your name? And he goes, it's gay. My last name's Gay. So she writes it down. She said, I don't know if we'll need you. Get on the plane. If we need you, I'll come and get you. So he goes on and goes to sit in his assigned seat, but there's someone there. So he takes another seat. The plane's oversold. The flight attendant goes back to where this guy's supposed to be sitting and says to the guy there, are you gay? <laughs> and there's this, like, apparently this hesitation for a second, and the guy went, well, yes. <laughs> Yes, I am gay. And she said to him, well, you've got to get off the plane. <laughs> At which point, Mr. Gay sees what's happening. He goes over and he says, no, I'm gay. And she goes, well, you've got to get off the plane. <laughs> and this ruckus starts. At which point, two queens in the middle of the plane stood up and said, well, we are gay and you cannot force us off this plane. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good night.